to this NRF Lunchtime Live. I'm Donald O'Donoghue, NRF President, and I am delighted to be joined today by clinical psychologist, Dr. Ashling O'Dwyer O'Brien. Ashling, how are you? I'm good, Donald. Thank you very much for having me today. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. And I'm delighted. We've had huge interest in today's topic. So we are joined today by, we had over uh, almost 500 people pre-register for the event. We're also going live across LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So we're, our audience today are going to be recruiters, HR professionals, business leaders, and people managers. And I think the topic of how we can support our workforce after probably the toughest year many of us have faced in our careers has really resonated with so many people. So we're delighted to have you with us today, Ashling. So I wonder, could we maybe start off, would you give us um, a bit of an introduction to yourself in terms of your, uh, your background, your qualifications and, and your interests? Sure, great. Um, so I suppose I started on my path in clinical psychology um, by doing a three-year degree in psychology in University College Dublin. Um, and then following that, I moved on to do a two-year master's in psychological research in UCD. Um, and then I had taken a, a little break from the psychology and uh, went and I did a performance diploma in classical violin um, in Trinity College, London. So a bit of a, a bit of a different path there. But I returned again to psychology um, to complete a three-year um, doctorate or PhD um, in University College Limerick, UL. Very good. Yeah, so I've been in college quite a while. <laughs> and in terms of your background, would you tell us a little bit about the earlier career? And I suppose what I'm interested to understand is your earlier career and then how you've now transitioned to, I suppose, supporting businesses. Okay, sure. So. I suppose I had worked both in the private sector and the public sector in, in various capacities in various guises. So in the private sector, such as St. John of God's, um, the Matter Hospital, St. Pat's. And then I worked in the public sector in the HSE and like service across the country. So the length and the breadth. Um, but I was working with people across the lifespan. So children, adolescents, adults um, with mental health but then I was also working with people with disability. So I have a kind of a wide variety of interests and a wide kind of, I suppose, depth of experience. And so I then set up my own company, uh, which is Flourish Psychological Service in November of last year in 2020. Um, and I was mainly working with adults and children at that time in terms of mental, mental health and psychological health. And I was doing assessments and intervention work and therapeutic work. And then I kind of was thinking to myself, okay, um, I think I might change tack here and I might diverge and engage in working with corporate clients or businesses and companies and organizations. And as you can hear from my background, I have a really strong interest in psychological health. And so what I suppose first sparked my interest was I was working with the adult population and clients who would come to me would often be coming, let's say, during or following a leave of absence, let's say from work. I'd be saying to them, well, you know, when did you first notice that you were struggling maybe with your mental health? Well, like, what were your first indicators to you that you kind of knew oh, there's something just not fully sitting right with me right now? They'd often say, you know, I was just so tired. I didn't have energy for work. I was in work and I had poor concentration, I had poor attention. You know, I just wasn't giving 100% in work. And people just generally disconnected, just going through the motions. And that not only was this impacting, let's say, them doing their job, but also then socially within their job, they just weren't interacting with people in, in the same way that they used to. Um, and so I suppose this brought me to think, well, what could I do that would support people's psychological health um, in a way that would be preventative and um, ensure that they wouldn't come to me, I suppose, at a later stage when they had a fully blown mental health difficulty. And I then thought, well, what would it be like if I supported workforces basically from a psychological perspective by providing like well-being programs so this is kind of what brought me to this point um, and I suppose I feel like it's very it's actually very timely given the fact that we've just gone through a very stressful period um, in our lives 
So yeah. that's, that's and it, it's interesting because from when I think about this from you know the talent acquisition or recruitment or human resources perspective, much of the time when we think about um, psychology, we're thinking about organizational psychology, organizational behavior, trait theory. We're thinking about people's preferred behavioral styles and how they interact with each other and what roles they're more suited to. But you're, you're right, it's absolutely timely after having the most, I think the most challenging year that many of us have ever faced in our careers. We've had situations where employees and managers are now dealing with situations around, you know, from the first lockdown crisis management, trying to perform in your role while also trying to juggle homeschooling or, or situations like that. We've had people dealing with bereavement. We've had people dealing with either reduced income or redundancy or loss of a position. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the expressions that I heard someone use the other day that resonated with me was that sense in work of having to run faster just to stand still, you know, while the, while the economy is challenged. And we've had, of course, the people that are working in personal services that have, um, you know, had their positions grind to a halt. So definitely a, a very, uh, a very challenging uh, time. So it is timely. So I suppose the question is, in terms of, um, you know, from a psychological perspective, what can, what can we do or what can, how can we support our workforces uh, from a psychological perspective? And what makes, I suppose, psychologists stand out in this, in this area? Absolutely. Um, so I suppose clinical psychologists, um, we're practitioners of science. So we're science practitioners. And I suppose we aim to support people through evidence-based interventions. So it's research-backed. Um, we use a scientist practitioner model of working. So we're always integrating the research that's out there and what will work in practice. And we're always constantly carefully considering the integration of those two things. So it's not that we just take something, we pluck it up and say, we're going to insert it here. It's always about adapting it and making it bespoke for what is required for the individual or for the company. And I suppose I feel that in terms of mental health or psychological health or well-being, clinical psychologists are, you know, we're, we're trained in that area. We were highly specialized in that area. And so I feel that in terms of providing people with supports in, in order to look after their mental health, you know, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their emotional difficulties during this time, I feel like we're really best placed to do that. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, I suppose, I suppose when I think about pre-pandemic, you know, a lot of the interventions that we would see when it comes to well-being or wellness were almost visual tokens. Uh, not that it's tokenism, but you'd see lunchtime yoga or Pilates, which obviously are great, or, um, you know, step challenges are very surface level things to encourage employees, you know, to get out of the office, to get some fresh air. And that's well and good in the steady state environment. But I suppose when we've when we've come out of this time where people have been thrown into chaos um, and their lives have been thrown into flux, I guess the question for me now is what kind of things or what kind of topics uh, can a psychologist like yourself support businesses with? And so I suppose we're looking at supporting businesses with managing that fallout from COVID-19. We're looking at things of how to manage psychological health in a foundational way that sets people up to be okay. We're looking at things like stress and burnout. We're looking at how do they manage to develop skills and coping strategies. And I suppose we need to do that right now because I suppose not only has it just been a pandemic in terms of, you know, a very, being a very trying time, trying time for all of us. It's also about the fact that I suppose people are also experiencing other things like domestic violence. There's, you know, altered patterns in people's engagement in alcohol, substance misuse. And I suppose over time, I suppose pre-pandemic, we would have seen, you know, the one in four statistic where within the general population, this is kind of the numbers that you're looking at. But now what's happened is that we still have that cohort of people who already experienced mental health. But now within the general population, there's now like one in five people who are going to experience psychological distress because of the pandemic. So things like general anxiety, health, panic, depression, that's the kind of stuff that clinical psychologists come in and support. We also need to think about the fallout at the very end of this kind of, you know, now that we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, 
I do think people's breaths, they're starting to breathe again and starting to kind of look for supports more. And so there's also a point where people are going to see those post-traumatic stress symptoms within the general population that obviously wouldn't have been there pre-pandemic. And some of these people in the general population, you know, one in five of those people are probably going to have symptoms. And that's not the people who would have previously had a mental health difficulty, if that makes sense. So some of these people then will go on to meet criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. And so what I want to do is I want to come in to companies. I want to support people in a way that allows for a preventative structure to be put in place so that it's not that, oh gosh, you know, now we've been working for these amount of months and we're starting to see things like um, absences. You know, people are, you know, starting to say, I can't come to work. I'm just not able. Or, you know, people's productivity, attention, concentration and memory being affected by their mental health or, you know, staff retention saying, you know, I just, I can't. Um, and employee relations falling apart because people's psychological health is intrinsically linked to all of those factors. You can't have, you know, um, psychological health without thinking about how it would negatively impact all of those factors. Um, and I think ultimately without psychological health, you're also going to be impacting upon, upon profitability, which I think is what businesses want, isn't it? They want to be successful. They, you know, it's easy to assume the sole determinant of profitability um, uh, is just, you know, being a competitive business. But I suppose a business is only as good as its people. And it's not just about, you know, training them to do their job. It's not just about the hiring practices, but it's about psychological health. It's about psychological well-being. And if we don't have a psychologically healthy workforce, well, then we can't continue with business as usual because people just can't do that yeah so I, I, I love that fair. idea i love that idea of um the preventative approach and early intervention because when you think about it as employers as people managers as business leaders there is a requirement on us to provide a safe working environment for our people and i almost think there's almost a bit of an irish mentality of just get on with it just get on with it say nothing it'll be grand just get on with it almost until it's too late and then when you think about burnout and you think about people being overwhelmed and feeling like they you know can't go into work and then we see increases in absenteeism if there isn't early intervention and um, you know if businesses don't put the proper supports in place and if ultimately the employee doesn't feel safe to come to the business and say I'm struggling at the moment things are really difficult if you say nothing and performance decreases that employee may end up in some kind of a, a performance management situation or you know, not performing, not meeting um, the objectives of the role. And without that early intervention and without communicating it, it can, it can get into a, a more difficult situation. So I, I love that idea of early intervention. Absolutely agree with you, Donald. Yeah, and it, it puts everybody, I suppose, in a tricky position. And I suppose catching it early now means that businesses are preparing for that. And I suppose ensuring that it doesn't come to that point um, because I don't think anyone wants to have to firefight that problem. It is much easier to use a preventative tool. Yeah. So what kind of tools then, if you think about your own business, Flourish Psychological Service, um, what uh, services are, are you offering businesses? So I suppose I, I, when I was kind of coming up with this idea, I was thinking maybe of two different types of support. So one would be um, a psychoeducational type workshop where I suppose we're starting to learn about psychological concepts within, I suppose, topics that are really pertinent within businesses. And I'm kind of maybe going to take you through some of those, maybe Donald, in a minute. In a minute. But these psychoeducational workshops would be kind of short, you know, and they wouldn't be um, very long in duration. So maybe one to two hours. Um, you might have a masterclass, uh, which would be all about, again, information and education, but you're giving people skills and strategies and you're practicing them there in that moment. And you're giving them a real flavor of what this feels like. What does this look like? And these programs can be run as a, like a lunch and a learn kind of workshop. Um, during work hours, it can be a wellness week. You can, you can have it at certain points during the week. It could be a yearly suite of programs where you say, well, we're gonna do this three times a week and this is what we provide. And we know from the research that I, that's out there is that people, employees, generally are looking for businesses that are providing them with these kind of wellness programs that care about 
how they are. And I think people as well often would pick a job that has something that would where they feel I'm being looked after than a job where they might have more pay. And we're actually seeing that very clearly within the research. Um, other areas that I'd be interested in supporting businesses with would be um, employee assistance programs, which is basically individual intervention sessions that will be, I suppose, confined to six to eight sessions. So it's time sensitive. It's not an ongoing forever um, intervention. Um, and then also consultancy. So I suppose that's what I'm hoping to offer um, from a psychological perspective. And then how do you how do you balance then, I suppose, because obviously there's a high level of confidentiality to the work and, and the individual's kind of confidentiality. So are the workshops kind of more on a general level? And then if somebody wants a further kind of one to one intervention, you can you can offer something like that. Absolutely, Donald. So I suppose what the workshops are is that there are low level interventions. So we have people who I suppose mental health is you know, at a low level. It's not it's not they're not very unwell, but they know that they're kind of, you know, on the edge teetering. Um, and they're the people who benefit from workshops and masterclasses. People who are moderate to kind of higher level mental health are going to need a bit more intense or a bit more in-depth support. And this is where that individual level support comes in. Alternatively, you might find some people saying, oh, well, you know, I, I found that workshop useful, but actually I'm struggling to implement these things. Like, I'm, I'm not really fully getting it or I need a bit more support in my own life to be able to do that. And that's where individual sessions come into practice. Um, and I see that from my own work, that you can give these workshops and you can give masterclasses. And there's so many people, you might get 60 to 70 percent of the people saying, I, I have it, I got it, this works, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And then there might be a few people in that cohort of, of 10 that might say, oh, well, actually, I might need a bit of extra support. Not always the case, but my experience. But then again, I suppose I'm working with a mental health population specifically. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really interesting is the concept of psychological safety. And um, I know when Google did their global longitudinal study where they looked at their high performance teams and the number one thing that came up was that piece around psychological safety. And I'm thinking about this because I had a conversation with somebody the other day um, who was probably, um, you know, a business leader, uh, probably a bit like myself, probably old school in terms of people management style. And that person was saying to me, you know, I can't wait to get the team back in the office and do this and so on. And that whole concept of psychological safety and, you know, recognizing that people are all at different points on this journey in terms of their readiness to return to work and their desire whether you know we've got some people that want to come back totally some people that never want to step foot back into an office again but the majority that want to have some kind of autonomy and some kind of control so just for the people that mightn't be familiar with the term of psychological safety would you maybe just comment a little bit on that and what we as potentially some of the old school kind of people managers can do in in, in terms of supporting people in that space sure so I suppose psychological safety is about creating a climate where people feel safe enough to bring up and share their concerns and have questions and offer their ideas um, in a way that it's, it's not knocked, in the way that it's validated. You know, I hear your concern. It makes sense to me that you would experience this. It's understandable. You know, I get you. I've felt this at times. And I suppose acknowledging the struggle that's there, because as you really adequately mentioned there earlier, Donald, you know, we do have this kind of sentiment to kind of say, just come on, get up, let's go. We're going to be fine. You know, it's, it's all good. Um, how are you today? Fine. Grand. Thanks. You know, and, and no, we're not. We're, we're, we're still in a pandemic where we're kind of only barely getting back out there. And, and we need we need that space to be able to be open about that. And that's what that is. And I think people, I think, become a bit scared around, you know, what happens if I ask and what's going to happen afterwards? Mm. But I suppose what I offer to people is, is that, look, we're all human. So what one person is experiencing, the likelihood is, is that you've experienced something similar to some degree. And having that, that, that need met means that actually you're being supported and you're, you're going to feel so much better within yourself to be able to engage in your working environment and, and with your peers. Um, and also psychological safety also supports innovation and growth and creativity. Um, so you're not only looking after your, 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 your workforce, 
um, but also you're looking after business. Yeah, I love that idea of the, you know, feeling safe that if you come with a proposal or an idea or if you make a decision that you can you can error without the, the fear of recrimination, you know, that it's that type of environment. And you touched a little bit on the psychoeducational workshops that you could provide for employees. Would you be able to give us maybe a, a bit of an overview on some of those or, or, or what, what sure. those kind of cover? Yeah, absolutely. OK, I, I have them written here, so I have them in my mind. So um, coping with COVID-19, I suppose, obviously, this was going to have to be one workshop that had to be created. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and I suppose now with easing of the restrictions, it's very timely with things opening up. But the point of this workshop was to explain to people and help people understand COVID-19 as a trauma. We as individuals, we as families, communities, societies, businesses, organizations, we're all in a trauma. And trauma can be defined as any event, you know, that has made us feel frightened and has felt left us feeling out of control, not in the driver's seat that we're disconnected from all kind of resourcefulness, safety, care, coping. And so the workshop aims to support people to understand that we're experiencing a traumatic stress and look at the specific factors that impact us physically as a result of traumatic stress. The emotional impact of traumatic stress, how traumatic stress affects our thinking. And when we even just think about those three factors and then you put somebody into a working environment and don't account for them, where are they? Where are we all? Um, and so I wanted to provide you know, businesses and the workforce with strategies and skills to cope with this kind of trauma in those three different areas. So if they're coping better, they're on a better pathway to healing. And I suppose overall, you're supporting your traumatized workforce, which ultimately ensures that you have productivity, creativity, and all the abilities. Um, so that, that's one particular workshop that I think is really important. And is that, a one, is that a one day or does that go on over a period of time? Or what, what does that look like if an organization said, look, that sounds like one of the things we'd like to put in place for our people? Sure. So as I was saying before, we can, we can, we can work together on that. I'm not going to put it into, it has to be this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm open, to, open to making it bespoke to suit your working environment. So if it needs to be a lunch and learn, that's fine. If it needs to be over two days with an hour and an hour, that's fine. Generally, I would say that I'd like these workshops to be about two hours. They are didactic and interactive. I want to provide people with space to, to hear information, but also to talk about it and come up with their own kind of, oh, this is my light bulb moment. And how do I put that into my practice in my life? That it's not just, I'm going to throw it at the wall and hope it sticks. Mm. You know, this, this, these kind of workshops, I want them to be beneficial. So I do feel that we can work together in that sense. Okay, and they can be tailored. So if there's a general workshop and there's a further intervention, if the organization identifies some people that could do with additional support, you can shape that depending on, on the need. On the need. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I have another workshop then, it's called Back to Basics, Me and My Psychological Health. Um, and as we've been talking about the pandemic, um, I suppose it very brought to my mind, you know, some people have, you know, when you see them even sometimes on social media, some people are so good at keeping their health routine. I myself now have to say I've been on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon, and I'm sure there's loads of people on this webinar today who could I uh, relate. Yeah, I've been on the chocolate, off the chocolate, all the way through. <laughs> Absolutely, myself included, Donal. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we all have struggled in various ways, and some people maybe more than others. And some people maybe have turned to maybe more unhelpful ways of coping. Mm. And so I thought to myself, well, there's no point in me giving them a higher order psychological intervention when actually all the foundational stuff is a bit higgledy-piggledy. And so I wanted to provide them with information based on research in relation to physical illness and the impact on psychological health. Because as we know, the pandemic has stopped quite a lot of people looking after their physical health. Um, you know, people not attending doctor's appointments, whether it's arthritis to cancer. So it's really important. Um, we look at exercise and the impact of psychological health, sleep and the impact on psychological health, nutrition, addiction, and then looking at, I suppose, how we can support the workforce on these basics, on these foundations to ensure people are more healthy in these areas. Uh, and again, this is useful for your your, your workforce and for your business productivity and so on. 
And are you seeing that the context of this pandemic is almost like a bit of a pressure cooker that if people had a predisposition towards, for example, addictive behavior or towards some of these areas that the context of the pandemic and the, the challenges that they're facing is, is just kind of increasing or, or bringing that to, to the fore? Absolutely. And I suppose, look, we all have coping mechanisms and some are more adaptive than others. So we have adaptive and maladaptive. The, the problem is, is that sometimes our maladaptive coping strategies are a quick fix. They are more appealing. We have tried and tested them. We know that they work. And so they're our go-to. It doesn't mean that they work in the long term. They're mm. a short-term gain for a very sometimes long-term pain. And so I suppose it's highlighting that within the workshop as well and highlighting it to people that, you know, you can, if you want, engage in maladaptive coping strategies, but in the long term, it actually, the fallout is great. And that's why people get sucked into engaging in these really unhelpful methods of managing and coping with stress and trauma, such as pandemic. Yeah. And you, you have another workshop for the, on the burnout piece that we spoke about earlier. Um, yes, I remember you liked that one. I, yeah, I liked all the bees. What was it again? So it was beating burnout and bouncing back. So <laughs> your alliteration there. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Had a career in marketing, I think, with a title like that. Um, yes. Tell us a bit yeah. about that one. It sounds very relevant for for what people are going through. Absolutely. And and you had touched on it earlier about you know that kind of working from home, the stresses of managing your children, their their homework. I suppose not having our usual outlets after work. You know whether it's going for the coffee, going for the hike, going for the pint, whatever it is. People don't have those outlets anymore. You're in a confined space, you know, you're within your home, there's no change. So burnout is a really big thing. And I suppose we all know burnout is workplace stress. And it can become quite chronic when it's not managed. Um, and I suppose we often find that when people come to me as a result of burnout, they say, I just didn't realise, didn't realise it was burning out. And I suppose this is one of the main focuses of this of this workshop will be to support people to see well, what's useful stress versus damaging stress and then help them to figure out, you know, because we're all individuals. So what are your triggers to the stress? So what stresses you out, Donald, mightn't stress me out and vice versa. Um, and, and then also knowing what are my my automatic stress responses? Well, what are they? You know, if you don't identify them, you're already there and you didn't know how you got there. Mm. Um, and so it's about how to interrupt those automatic stress responses. It's about how to manage your perception of stress, how to manage that emotion that comes with it, how to manage your behavior that comes with it, how to manage the general events around you when they're stressful. And so this workshop looks at providing people with resilience, basically. It's about being, you know, having been flattened and being able to bounce back into shape. So there's a toughness to it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I can build back up. But there's also an elasticity. So it's not, it's about being ebbing and flowing. It's not just about a concrete block. And I, I think that's also really an important concept when we think about coming back to work. We're not going back to work as it was before the pandemic. Life is not going to be that. And it's not even the new normal. It's a new, new normal because it's another adaption. It's another change. And I suppose that requires of us to be resilient. And it requires a, of us to be what's out there now. The per popular term for it is emotional agility. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think we've talked quite a bit on other webinars, on other lunchtime lives about the journey that people managers have gone on uh, in the past year and about how we've had to trust people in terms of employees that we can't see, that we're no longer managing through presenteeism, that we're now managing through outcomes. And there's, there's that development piece for people managers but the other one that's really interesting is that compassion because when you think about it people that are managing sales teams for example and um, you might have seen in the past where uh, a salesperson's performance has fallen and it almost became a thing oh to say the person is burnt out or they've lost their legs to use the football term or something like that and th there was almost a, a dismissive approach to it so I think what you're describing here is actually giving people the tools that have been able to achieve um, high performance or achieve good per performance in the past, maybe burnt out and experiencing these 
challenges that are part of you know, their predisposition, but also against the context that we're in and actually giving them the tools to return to, to good performance, uh, which is better for everyone. It's better for the individual and it's, it's better for the organization. So um, is that something, is that kind of a training piece that you can do for people managers as well to help bring them on a bit of a journey? Is that something as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be very much open to that. One of the workshops that I actually provide is a workshop on self-compassion and I call it self-compassion action. <clears throat> and I think, you know, this is, is not only useful, I suppose, for employees, but also managers. Um, and I suppose having worked in various roles with different populations, I often see that people are just, you know, very self-critical and they're very hard on themselves and their inner critic is strong. And I suppose this is driven from at a societal level when you think about it, really. Um, you know, everything is about the push about being better. Um, and absolutely, we want to be. But I suppose the, the beating of the stick version to get there actually isn't always the most productive. And research will show us that, that using a threat version um, actually, you know, doesn't support the person to be better. Actually, if anything, it decreases productivity and it decreases creativity. And so... I wanted to kind of come up with a workshop that would support people's understanding about that. So I think people, when they hear self-compassion, they go, oh, that's such a soft and fluffy concept. And you'll be letting everybody away with everything. Um, and that's really not the case. Um, and I suppose self-compassion is about acknowledging the pain and suffering of where you're at. And that actually it's a universal thing. It's, 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 a, it's, it's all of humanity experiences it. And it's about providing kindness and care and focusing your attention your energy on that point to alleviate the suffering or the pain yeah. um, and this has great I suppose impacts on mental health and, and we see that now kind of I suppose coming to the fore within the research there's a, a definite trend um, and I'd love to go into describing what self-compassion is but I, I'm just conscious of time Donal would I have yeah. time to kind of describe it or maybe not yeah absolutely because I think as as people leaders we can have compassion but it doesn't remove the need for the employee to have accountability and I think by increasing the compassion, you, you get a, a sense of actually people uh, taking autonomy and actually wanting to do well for the organization when there's that uh, reciprocal kind of uh, compassion. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to, to hear a little more about it. Sure. So I suppose from a, um, a compassion focused therapy perspective or model or theory, um, and it's kind of based in evolution, we have three modes of being. So we have a, a, a soothe mode, we have a threat mode and we have a drive mode. So soothe mode is kind of developed from when we were, you know, caregiver to infant. It's within the animal kingdom as well. This is the one that I suppose is where we're receiving care and support. And it causes the release of neurochemicals like oxytocin, um, opiates, natural opiates. And then also we have the threat system, obviously, which is which when we're in danger and has allowed us to survive to, as a species to today. Um, and then we also have the drive system, which is about being active in our everyday lives. Problem is, is that when we get stuck up and down in the threat and the drive system only, and we don't have that compassion or that self-compassion system, we become really unwell because you're on a motor um, and, and it's, it's not a healthy one. But what self-compassion or soothe section or soothe mode does is that it allows us to come in and to cool down the threat system and provides an alternative path to get to drive. And so we find within the research that this reduces people's anxiety, anger, and depression to have, allow them to have a more balanced life. Um, and that's what this workshop looks at. It looks at, you know, what are the barriers to you being self-compassionate? It looks at preparing you to engage in more self-compassionate thinking, behavior, um, and emotions that ultimately lead you to have a more self-compassionate way of living. Very good. Um, th there's an interesting question that's come in there from Peter Fitzpatrick, and it's a bit of a curveball, but I'll throw it at oh you. Oh, God, hello, Peter. <laughs> he says, Ashlyn, could you possibly touch on your musical experience and how we can tap into that part of our brains slash hearts to cope with COVID stress, et cetera? Oh, that's absolutely. Good question, isn't it? Love it, Peter. Um, okay, so I suppose music... If I, if I go back to an, an evolutionary perspective, the Neanderthals, okay, so there were different types of species um, 
uh, Homo sapiens being one, but Neanderthals were a little bit behind that. And actually Neanderthals were the first species to use music as a form of communication. That's their language, kind of like the way birds and so on. And I suppose it is an, an, an integral part of us. Music is universal. So when we hear something on, let's say a film, music on a film, if you mute the film, the likelihood is what you see on the screen is not going to make you sad, happy or scared, it's the music. And in the same way, music is a support to us. It is a way of self-soothing um, and it is a way of feeling united or understood um, or validated in our experience. Um, it's a way of expressing sometimes when words just fail us. Um, and I, I really do find that with music, that sometimes, you know, we can be limited by our language, but music has no bounds, it's often said. Um, and so I think that using music in, whether it's listening to it, whether it's playing it, whether it's, I don't know, using a saucepan and a, two spoons, I don't know, to make some type of rhythm, it's all form of music. Um, and I think even listening to music in the outside world, whether that's, you know, the bird singing or listening to the wind or the sea, like it's all forms of music. And I think music nowadays has taken, deviating now, but music has taken a new, um, it's more about how sounds in the outside world are actually forms of music. And you can see it now being very much incorporated into the music of the 20th, 20th century, 21st century. Um, so Peter, I hope that's, that answers your question. That's fascinating. That could be a whole, a whole new lunchtime live in that area. And um, one of the areas I'd love you to touch on, and this, I know you've got a, a workshop for managers in this space, and it's a space that's very close to uh, my heart and to many people in the, in the National Recruitment Federation is neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, could you tell us maybe a little bit uh, about the workshop that you do for managers in that space? Sure. So um, what I aim to do with this, with this workshop is to explain, I suppose, what neurodiversity is. And it's basically about how our brains function in so many different ways and in such a variety of diverse ways. Um, and when people are neurodivergent or when we are born with things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, autism, ADHD or attention, um, hyperactivity disorder or OCD, it is, I suppose, a way of being physically or biologically different. And this impacts the way we think. It impacts the way we learn. It impacts the way we process information. And it impacts how we relate to other people. Now, these people can be really highly skilled. They bring alternative views. They have new ideas. They have new concepts. They, you know, we might think about something this way. They might think about something that way. And so if we don't account for these people within our workforce, to support them, you know, in terms of like, let's say having an inclusive recruitment process or having a neurodiverse environment where these people can feel psychologically safe as well as physically safe sometimes. If we don't do that as, you know, employers or managers or HR professionals, actually we're, we're really losing a really important um, aspect of our workforce um, because they have a lot to offer. Um, and so I think that that's what that kind of um, workshop looks at. It looks at how to create a more neurodiverse recruitment process and how to make a more neurodiverse environment. And what does that look like? It touches on just the, the very beginnings of it. And obviously, if it's something that people are interested in, I'd be more than happy to you know, chat about how the how of that, um, how to do um, consulting with whoever. Yeah, because it's fascinating, because when you think about the the traditional or the old school recruitment process, what it really measured was uh, a person's ability to build a rapport and to relate to somebody. It often didn't look at the at the core competencies of the role and the ability to, to deliver a role. So I think that's a really valuable workshop that people will find uh, useful. And the other thing that I just, I suppose, like to talk to you about a little bit at the moment is on the well-being side of things. A lot of people are talking nowadays about mindfulness. And so could you just kind of give us a bit of an overview? Because I'm probably a little bit skeptical sometimes when I hear the term mindfulness, I hear it in all sorts of, you know, uh, experience the leaves crackling under your feet kind of thing and stopping in the moment, which is fine, but it didn't resonate with me. So could you give me kind of a, a bit of an overview on sure. mindfulness yeah. from your perspective? 
Sure. So I suppose first it is to say that mindfulness does have an awful lot of research um, completed on it. And it is definitely found to reduce stress, improve concentration, attention, resilience and, and well-being. We know that. And it is about focusing on the here and now and not getting stuck on the past or the future. However, I feel like that aspect of mindfulness is where I suppose out there in the in society or from the media, I feel like that's the only aspect that they hear. Um, and, and my issue with that is that it, this leads to, I suppose, an avoidance strategy. Um, because the main reason we want to engage people with mindfulness is, is to help them heal. And we can't heal what we can't feel. And actually, mindfulness is about getting in here, you know, into the feeling center which is the icky part where everybody doesn't like it, you know? Um, but that's what it's about. It's not just about sitting down at your lunchtime and mindfully eating your biscuit or listening to the leaves crunching under your feet, even though it is about those things. It's also about uh, um, being able to calmly acknowledge and accept your feelings when they arise, um, to calmly and be okay with your thoughts and to recognize them. So thoughts actually are very automatic. Um, I, I think if, if, if you do a test on yourself and, and take one full minute and write down every time you get a thought, you'll be really shocked at how many times a thought will come into your mind um, when you go to do that strategy um, or that technique. Um, it's also about being aware of your bodily sensations because we're, we're so taken out of our bodies nowadays that actually our bodies are telling us so much information and actually it can tell you about how to react in a certain situation or not. Um, and so this kind of masterclass would aim to provide you with a certain set of skills that allow you not only, I suppose, be able to think in the here and now and do the focusing, but also be able to manage your thoughts better, to manage your emotions better, and to be able to cope with the sensations and recognize them from almost an outsider's perspective, looking in at them, so that you're not as attached. So you're, you're able to respond in a better way rather than react to your world. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The other thing that I'm seeing um, an increase in is, or that I'm hearing an increase in, is, again, it's probably coming back to the context we're in at the moment. Um, and it's probably coming back to what you touched on earlier and that many people are finding themselves under pressure and functioning in that threat response space quite a bit. That conflict, you know, interdepartmental conflict uh, is on the rise or uh, person to person, colleague to colleague conflict is on the rise. Uh, can you talk to us a, a little bit about, uh, I'm sure you've got a, a workshop that's conflict management or something in, in that uh, space you could talk to us about? Absolutely. So I, I do provide a workshop or a masterclass on, it's called Connections and Conflict. And you're, you're spot on, Donald, like I suppose, you know, we're, we're currently, as I've been saying, in a stress reaction or a stress response um, due to trauma. Um, and I know I, I use that word and I know a lot of people are like, oh, that's such a, you know, you're, you're exaggerating. I'm really not. Like this is a trauma. It's acute. It's acute type of trauma, um, COVID-19 and the pandemic. And so when we're there, I suppose you're right, you are coming from a place of threat. And so our reactions are, are on edge. So those, I suppose, workshops that I've been speaking with prior are really important for managing that. The next level up will be something like this one that I was talking about, the connections and conflict. And what we want to do is provide people with the strategies and tools in order to be able to connect with their colleagues, but also to be able to manage, I suppose, or react or respond to people in different ways to manage it. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. Um, and without having the skills that you can engage in, I suppose it leads to people miscommunicating or misunderstanding. Um, and don't get me wrong, like diversity of experience and thought is a good thing. Like it's really important. Like it's important that I would have a different view from, from you. And, and, and we had talked about having psychological safety and, and, and the requirement for that and why it's needed. And it is okay to have, I suppose, a healthy amount of competition between teams, but that if we don't have the skills and the mechanisms to be able to manage it and cope with it and tolerate it, actually then it becomes negative conflict. So it's not just a discussion anymore. And then this is where that leads into people saying, well, well I'm, not, I'm not offering that piece of information because I'm not going to listen anyway. Mm. So it kind of ties into all of the pieces that we've discussed earlier. But this really focuses in on the interpersonal skills that will kind of 
take you through not only just, I suppose, your working environment and your interpersonal peer to peer interactions, but also life. Really. Yeah, I think there's a huge value in that. And even by having that kind of a workshop and even by putting it on the agenda and making people aware of when they're in that threat response space and feeling territorial about their work area or feeling protective of their work area uh, and moving from that threat space to the reward space where there's collaboration and safety. Uh, I think that's so valuable for businesses. So that is, that's really useful. Uh, just a comment that came in there from Wendy McPherson. She said, we're also having to deal with the psychological well-being of our customers and clients, neighbors. Um, and as we interact more there, that could also, you know, there could also be a rise in conflict there, which I think is, it's not so much a, a question as an observation. And I, I think it's, uh, it's a very valid one, I think. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Wendy. Um, yeah, no, it does make sense. And I suppose exactly as we're saying, it's because we're all in traumatic stress. We're all teetering on the edge. There are certain things that might set you off and certain things that might set me off. But look, at we're all only human. And so it's about now developing the skills to manage ourselves better, given the fact that we know that we've just been in this termless time. Well, look, I think that is a really nice place for us to finish up because as we are uh, seeing the vaccine being rolled out and as we are seeing uh, talk of economic improvements and positivity, I think this is a really good time for organisations to invest in their people um, and so I think as a next step from this, Ashling, if it's OK with you, if you'd like to share a one pager or a PDF, uh, Anna at NRF.ie will be happy to circulate that to the attendees. We have people that um, attended this session live uh, on Zoom. We have people that have watched it live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, across all the different social channels. So by all means, please feel free to connect uh, with Ashling and reach out to her directly if there is uh, any of the areas that you feel that your organisation could uh, use support with. Uh, so on behalf of the National Recruitment Federation, Ashling, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your time uh, in preparing and talking with us today on Lunchtime Live. And... Um, and thank you very much, Donald, for having me and, and thanks everybody for tuning in today. Um, uh, it's been Super. great so yeah well you. we look forward to hearing more from you and again if anybody wants any follow-up information we'll be happy to share that Absolutely. thanks very much everybody and see you next time thank you bye